First question, the audience wants to know, is it being used at all in humans or is it still only in the laboratory? It's in the laboratory. The one piece of, of it that's been used in humans um, is that when we go to the, to the surgical um, suite, we are actually able to take pieces from patients who are undergoing surgery, so cancer samples from patients who are having their cancer surgery, or pieces of nerve from patients who are having some other procedures where part of their nerves are taken out. And then we take the, the material and we dunk it into the solution, and so we know that it works, <laughs> but in order for it to be in a patient requires FDA approval and instrumentation, so it's not in humans yet. How many years has it taken to get from when you begin this innovation process to what we've seen just today. It's, I know you mentioned a starting point, but I thought it would be sure, work again. Sure, sure. So we started working on the tumor probe in 2004. Right. We finally published that work in um, 2010. And then the nerve work we started in 2009, and then we actually just published it this year. So this brings up Juan Enriquez's early point. How many people aren't being helped because we don't measure the number of people who would directly benefit from what seems like a pretty obvious benefit. Is there something maybe we're missing here that this has a danger, a side effect? Or are there issues here? Is there a dark side to this light story? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that what you, what you say, how many people are we missing when we don't have this technology? Well, how many people have to go back for salvage surgery? How many times does that happen? I think it happens too often. You know, in breast cancer, it can happen between 30 to 50% of the time that there's a positive margin. How many times does it take for you to say that having erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence after prostate surgery is, is too many? I think any time is too many. I think we need to be able to see, you know, what we're doing. So Lance Armstrong talks to us about a sense of urgency, right? And here we see a way to reduce mortality in cancer by preventing recurrence or essentially eliminating the error rate in the surgical process, some of which obviously metastasizes and kills people of one of those one a minute. And yet that urgency doesn't seem to be able to help you much. You're right. And, you know, I think it touches to the point where I was uh, mentioning that there is just not a straightforward mechanism in the way that w we as a society function today to develop a molecule for single time use. You know, you saw how difficult this, it, it is um, from yesterday's talk from, from Ger and from, and from David that to get through the FDA is so arduous. There's only 21 drugs approved in 2008, and I saw that there were 800,000 articles published that year. So let's say, you know, one for per thousand, that's maybe 800, you know, potential candidates that were being innovated, and yet to get the drug to um, the FDA, is, there was only 21. And yet, that is for, not for a single time use, that's, you know, for a multi-use product so understandably, a single time use product is, is going to have even harder struggles. And I think that brings me to the point that in order for this to happen, we as a community need to enable a paradigm shift in the way we evaluate outcome, in the way that we evaluate, you know, what is, you know, what is our metric? What do we want to measure? Do we want to measure outcome? Do we want to measure, you know, the benefit to the patient? Do we want to measure you know, function after surgery. I think all of those are, you know, relevant to, to the discussion today. Well, on behalf of all of us, with your patience and your determination, it's going to happen sooner than never, but we very much appreciate your stick to itness, and obviously there's a message here for all of us. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank really. you.